this is my effort to suggest that framework. We're talking about, I'd include Libya here, but we're talking about a region that is basically bounded as we see on this map, right? And I'll occasionally revert back to this map, but you all know what's happening, right? I mean, what we have is a civil war in Syria, right? a relatively weak state with civil strife in Iraq, a very weak state with a submerged civil conflict in Lebanon, a proto-state in the West Bank and Gaza of Palestine right, that is divided right, and at odds with each other, with two elements of it, uh, an area in, of Egypt that is, I wouldn't say ungoverned, but that, it, it, but that is uh, open to sub-state actors in a way that perhaps it hasn't been in the past. Right? An extremely weak state in Yemen, right, that has, in which uh, all sorts of sub-state actors, including a uh, franchise of Al-Qaeda, has uh, begun to play a more important role. And in Libya, right, a collapsed state in which uh, militias, regional groups, ideological formations have, uh, in essence, taken control from a, a, a collapsed government and the reconstruction of a successor government is going, shall we say, uh, slowly. That's the new Middle East Cold War. Why do I say new? Right. Well, those of us old enough to remember this guy, <coughs> who is Gamal Abdel Nasser, who was the president of Egypt from 1954 till his death in 1970, might remember the last Cold War in the region. Right. This is a Cold War famously dubbed so by the late Malcolm Kerr, former president of the American University in Cairo, former professor of political science at UCLA, who of course was assassinated by Hezbollah in uh, 1983. So he is both a uh, patron saint and martyr of my profession of the Middle East political scientists. He wrote a book called The Arab Cold War. Right, Gamal Abdel Nasser and his rivals, 1958 to 1970. Another uh, locus classicus of this period is the uh, British, uh, British researcher and, and journalist Patrick Seale's classic book, The Struggle for Syria. Right? If you want to understand what's going on in the Middle East today, these are not bad <laughs> starting points. Right? Why a Cold War? Right? Why do I call this a Cold War? Right? Basically because there's no direct military confrontation between the major antagonists, right? Nasser's power wasn't based on the Egyptian army conquering countries. In fact, during the 50s and 60s, when he deployed the Egyptian army, the results were normally disastrous. And today, no one really fears that the Iranian army and the Saudi Arabian army are going to have a clash on the battlefield even though those are the two main protagonists in this new Middle East Cold War. Right? So it's a Cold War in that your military power is not the centrally important factor determining who's going to win and who's going to lose. Right? Rather, it's a Cold War because it's played out of the domestic political systems of weak Arab states. Gamal Abdel Nasser had an ideology, pan-Arabism, that was extremely uh, uh, attractive to Arabs living in weak states like Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Iraq and Yemen. And he used the technology of his day, not Facebook, not Twitter, right? not the internet, but the transistor radio, to basically appeal to these people over the heads of their own governments, over the heads of their own leaders, to support him in their own domestic political struggles and try to push their governments, either push them aside or push their governments to support Nasser's foreign policy. That's what's happening today. The Iranians are supporting clients in weak Arab states like Lebanon, Syria, Iraq. The Saudis are supporting their clients in these same weak Arab states. The Turks are trying to play into this game. Even the Qataris are playing into this game. Right? And the coin of the realm here is literally coin and guns, but not the guns that your own army 
wields against its opponents, but rather the guns and the money that you can get to your clients in these weak Arab states as they fight out their own domestic political struggles. The new Middle East Cold War is also similar to the uh, Arab Cold War of the 50s and 60s in that there's more than one conflict axis. In the Arab Cold War, it was the progressives, quote unquote, Nasser, against the reactionaries like the Saudis, the monarchies, the King of Jordan. But there was also a really serious fight among the progressives between Gamal Abdel Nasser and Abdel Karim Qasim, who overthrew the Iraqi monarchy in 1958, between Nasser and the Ba'ath Party in Syria, which was his frenemy. And for those of you who don't know the term frenemy, they were, they were allied. Uh, during quite a bit of this time, but let's just say the Ba'ath was a, an extremely difficult and troublesome ally for Nazi. In the new Middle East Cold War, right, we tend to uh, hear a lot about Iran versus Saudi. What we're hearing more about now is the intra-Sunni fight between Saudi Arabia and the Muslim Brotherhood and the Muslim Brotherhood's supporters in Qatar and to a lesser extent in Turkey. Right? So this is not simply a bipolar fight between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Right? This, is a, this is a fight that has more than one conflict axis, much like the, the old Arab Cold War. All right. Because it's a Cold War, there are some paradoxes about the power here. Right? Ask yourself, between Israel and Qatar, who do you think would have more influence in a regional international fight? Well, I would immediately say Israel. It is the most powerful military actor in the Middle East. Nobody in the Middle East can match Israel's army. And yet Israel is basically a non-actor so far in the, in the new Middle East Cold War. Qatar is one of the smallest, if not the smallest country in the Arab world. Let me think for a second. Yeah. Right. Bahrain, Bahrain, if you, but if you count citizens, which are kind of hard to find in Qatar, but they exist, right? Qatar would be the smallest country in terms of population in the, in the Middle East, right? And yet Qatar is punching way above its weight in this new Middle East Cold War, right? The reason is the tools of this new Middle East Cold War are not a powerful army that can cross borders and destroy and defeat opponents. The instruments of this new Middle East Cold War are an information strategy, which Qatar has through Al Jazeera, money and guns to provide to your clients, and transnational links that make you an acceptable patron for clients that you are trying to patronize. And the Qataris early on decided that they were going to patronize the Muslim Brotherhood, which for a while looked like a really good bet, and now maybe not so good. Another paradox of power I ask, I ask myself about is, why are the Iranians doing so well in the new Middle East Cold War? Is it because of their military power? Is it because people are worried about the Iranian army crossing borders, marching into countries, taking them over? No. It's because of this guy. This handsome fellow is General Qasem Soleimani, who is head of the Quds Force, which is that element of the Iranian the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran that is in charge of foreign operations. What General Soleimani can do is bring to bear resources, manpower, and reliable clients like Hezbollah to support his side, to support the clients of Iran in fights like the Syrian civil war. Right? One of the differences between Iran and Saudi Arabia, the two main protagonists in this Middle East Cold War, is that the Iranians conduct their own policies. The Saudis have to subcontract. Right? The Saudis don't have Qasem, so they don't have the equivalent of Qasem Soleimani. Right? 
They have to find local clients, right? Through middlemen, through brokers, right? And those local clients are never going to be as reliable as your own people or client groups with which you have developed decades long ideological and political ties. The final paradox of power that I'll put forward to you is uh, the role of Turkey. If we go back to the mid-2000s, right, the country that seemed to be on the ascent in terms of influence in the Middle East was Turkey. And it was very much a soft power strategy. Although Turkey is clearly one of the most important and powerful military actors in the Middle East, right? a NATO ally with an extremely large army, an effective air force. The way the Iranians, I'm sorry, the way the Turks were trying to extend their influence was through what, you know, for want of a better term, and I kind of hate it, but everybody uses it now, the soft power. They were extending trade relations. Right? They had first off changed uh, the orientation of Turkish foreign policy to what the foreign minister, Ahmed Davidoglu, called a policy of, of no problems with neighbors. So they improved historically bad relations with Iran and Syria. They had completely reversed the former hostility of the Turkish government toward the de facto uh, autonomous Kurdish <coughs> regional government of Iraq. They had even made nice with the Greeks, believe it or not, which, you know, for Turks is hard to do. This new policy of no problems with neighbors opened up possibilities for Turkey economically. Lots of Turkish business started being done in the Arab world and in Kurdistan. Culturally, Turkish soap operas were all the rage in the Arab world. Right. Arab tourism to Turkey took off. And Turkey really seemed to be a country on the make. Right? It was a model of democracy, moderate Islamist governance, talking about the mid-2000s, right? and economic success right, in a region that uh, had none of those. So everybody thought the Turks were going to be the new players in the Middle East. And to top it off, the Prime Minister Erdogan right, uh, chewed out the Israeli President Shimon Peres at Davos on TV, and so all the Arabs thought he was a great guy. Right? Played on that anti-Israeli sentiment that's very strong in Arab public opinion. But what happens when the, Tur when the, when the Syrian civil war starts? Soft power doesn't do you much good in a civil war. It's Saudi money. Right? rather than Turkish soft power that can support clients in the Syrian civil war. So this Middle East Cold War right, has a number of paradoxes of power, the bottom line of which basically is the size of your military is not that important in who, who gets the upper hand in this Cold War. Your ability to foster good relations with client groups and supply them with the resources they need to do well in their domestic political fights is the way you win. All right. So I said that I thought that there was a, a, a that the frameworks that, that we commonly understand this conflict in the Middle East these days were flawed. And the, and the, and the one that I think that it, what I really meant was the Sunni Shia conflict. Right? So is what's going on in the Middle East right now a Sunni Shia conflict? And I want to say no. It's not. I'm not denying that sectarianism is an important element of many of the, of the domestic political fights that we see in the region. And I'm going to speak to that in a moment. But I think that it's a vast oversimplification. It's an understandable one, given the killing that we see in Syria, right, given the conflict in Lebanon, right, given the killing we see in Iraq. It's an understandable shorthand for journalists and analysts to say Sunni Shia. But I think that it would be a real mistake for us to stop at that shorthand, because I think that if we only see this as a Sunni-Shia conflict, we profoundly misunderstand the dynamics at work here. Right? First off, it's an oversimplification. Kurds are an ethnic group, and, and, and 
in both Syria and Iraq, Kurdish ethnic identity has trumped sectarian differences, and there are both Sunni and Shia Kurds. And the Kurds have acted not on a Sunni-Shia basis, but rather on the basis of ethnic solidarity. Lebanese Christians playing into this game. Probably the big thing for me is this whole framework has made the Alawis in Syria into Shia. The Alawis are a break-off of Shiism. No good Shi'i theologian would see them as Shia. But we've made them into Shia because they were completely different, on a completely different, I would say, balance of power basis. The Syrian state had a long alliance with the Iranian revolutionary state from 1980. I think understanding the basis of that alliance has very little to do with sectarianism and lots more to do with common enemies in Israel and Saddam Hussein at the time. And now, in, in, in uh, a common strategic opposition to the United States and Saudi Arabia in the Middle East. So it's an oversimplification. Lots of people see this as a, a, a top-down <coughs> sectarian fight, driven by Shia Iran and Sunni Saudi Arabia. But I don't think that's the way either the Iranian state or the Saudi state views this conflict. They don't make explicit sectarian arguments. Right? Now, we shouldn't always you know, put a lot of stock in what political leaders say as to what their true motives are. But it is extremely interesting that in this very heightened, this period of heightened sectarianism, neither official Saudi spokesmen or official Iranian spokesmen make sectarian arguments about their politics. Right? And in fact, both have tried to, to cross over the sectarian line when they could. The Iranians, of course, by trying to champion the Palestinian Islamists, be it Hamas, Islamic Jihad in Palestine, and by being the one major Middle Eastern state that takes an explicitly rejectionist position toward Israel. <coughs> and the Saudis, I would argue, uh, the best evidence of the fact that they are not driven by sectarian motives here was their very strong support for Iyad Alawi, the head of the Iraqiya party in Iraq, uh, in the elections of both uh, 2005 and 2010. Right? Iyad Alawi is a Shi'i. Right? He's a completely secular man. But he's a Shi'i who put together a, a cross-sectarian and cross-ethnic political <coughs> party called Iraqiya, the Iraq party. Right? Uh, and competed in those elections. In 2010, he actually got a plurality of the seats. He beat Nuri al-Maliki by two votes, or two seats, right? uh, but was unable to put together a parliamentary majority. Uh, Alawi was funded uh, by Saudi Arabia. The Saudis were open in their support for him. There were sectarian Sunni parties in Iraq running in these elections. They're not the ones that Saudi Arabia supports. And finally, as I mentioned before, I think probably the, the most damning bit of evidence against this kind of simple Sunni-Shia framework is the really profound intra-Sunni tensions that have emerged since the Arab Spring between the Muslim Brotherhood and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. So I don't see this as a Sunni-Shia conflict, and I think it's a mistake for us to see it that way. What is it? This is, a, this is a conflict that I would argue is based on the weakness or breakdown of state authority that invites regional intervention. Lots of people have talked about a Shia crescent, right? a, a, a term coined by King Abdullah II of Jordan back in an interview with the Washington Post, I think back in 2004 or something. I don't see a Shia crescent. What I see is a crescent of, shit, of state weakness in the Middle East that goes from Palestine through Lebanon, Syria, Iraq. You can take the outliers in Yemen and Libya and put them in as well. It's this weakness or breakdown of state authority that creates the political vacuums into which regional powers are drawn. They're not just drawn, they're invited. 
by local players who are seeking support for their own domestic political reasons in fights that they have. This process predates the Arab Spring. Right? Le Lebanon and Yemen are, for historical reasons, have always been weak states in which outsiders have played right, important roles in their politics. Very easily penetrated. The 2003 American invasion was the coup de grace right, for the Iraqi state. The Iraqi state had been greatly weakened by Saddam Hussein's erratic foreign policy, by the international sanctions under which Iraq uh, had, had labored since 1990. But the United States invasion of Iraq in 2003 basically destroyed the three pillars of the modern third world state. We made uh, the ruling party illegal. We, well, let's say the United States, disbanded the Iraqi army. And we took the top cadre of the Iraqi bureaucracy and basically uh, said that they couldn't uh, have a role in the, in the rebuilding of the Iraqi state because they had all been members of the Ba'ath Party. So we crippled the bureaucracy, disbanded the army, and, and, and uh, uh, made illegal the ruling party. That basically destroys the state. And of course in Palestine, the beginnings of a proto-state under <clears throat> Arafat, right, the 2007 split between Fatah and Hamas, right, ended the, the, the development of what looked like it was going to be another kind of security state in the Arab world. Then finally, the Arab Spring adds Syria and Libya to this list of weak or failing states. And with so many political vacuums, in essence you get the new <coughs> Middle East Cold War. The sectarianism that characterizes so many of these conflicts in the region is a bottom-up phenomenon. It's not top-down, I would argue. It's not driven by Saudi Arabia and Iran. It's driven by the fact that when the state ceases to perform its basic functions of providing kind of minimal security and minimal service to its citizens, those citizens will look for protection <coughs> somewhere else. They'll look for protection right, in communities in which they feel safe. In many of these, but not all of these places, those communities, for historical reasons, are sectarian. Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq most directly. So that sectarianism bubbles up from the bottom as the state collapses or ceases to function. And then those sectarian combatants in these civil conflicts look outside for support, for patrons, because they need them. And there is, of course, a natural affinity for the Shia to look to Iran and for Sunni groups to look to Saudi Arabia. And the Saudis and the, and the Iranians exploit that. They exploit sectarianism for their own aims, for their own aims and ends, no question. But they don't force sectarianism on these fights. The sectarianism comes from below. <clears throat> I have a, a longer argument about how this, this breakdown of state authority in these places basically reverses a decades-long trend in the Arab world. But the Arab world was actually, with some exceptions like Lebanon and Yemen, developing strong states. Right? Now, these states were ugly. They were, they were uh, security-driven. Right? They were uh, oppressive. They didn't allow freedom of speech or, or freedom of political association. Uh, the dead hand of the state was very heavy on the economy. I'm not saying that these places were necessarily good places to live. Right? But the process of state building has never been a pretty one, right? Uh, uh, Henry VIII and Cardinal Richelieu were not nice men, right? But what we were seeing through oil wealth and the development <coughs> of security, uh, internal security forces and and, and the states take over of so much of the economy in these places, was, were, were states that were able to control their societies in ugly and sometimes brutal ways, but were able to control their societies. 
I, I think that what we have now is a reversal of that historic trend. All right. Iran is well positioned to do well in this new Middle East Cold War. It has the Shia connections right, in places where the state is weak and Shia, the Shia have majorities or pluralities like Iraq, majority, Lebanon plurality, perhaps even in some Gulf states in Yemen, Palestine for ideological reasons, the axis of resistance, Iran being kind of the, the only major regional power taking a, 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 an explicit anti-Israeli stance, and this history of the strong state to state alliance with Syria. So you've got President Ahmadinejad with Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah in Lebanon. You've got him with Bashar al-Assad. He forgot his tie that day, but Bashar al-Assad remembered his. So. That's a joke. Uh, he's not supposed to wear a tie. You've got the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, with the Prime Minister of Iraq, Nouri al-Maliki. In essence, the Iranians kept Nouri al-Maliki as Prime Minister of Iraq after his coming in second to Iyad Alawi in the 2010 elections. And Khalid Mishad, right, the head of Hamas outside of Palestine, meeting with President Ahmadinejad. Right, so the Iranians were well positioned to take advantage of, of this, to, to, to expand their influence in this new Middle East Cold War. And that's why Saudi Arabia saw Syria. Right? That's why the Saudis put such stock in Syria. It was their best chance to roll back Iranian influence after the Iranians, frankly, had dealt the Saudis a number of defeats in this new Middle East Cold War. In Lebanon, in Iraq, in Palestine. If you follow this game, right, you're kind of familiar with the, with the Iranian versus Saudi framework, right? But what you might not be following as closely is the intra-Sunni axis of conflict in the new Middle East Cold War, which I think is equally important for the future of the region. The Muslim Brotherhood looked like it was doing extremely well in the Arab Spring, of course. A plurality election in Tunisia that returned a NAFTA, which in essence is the Muslim Brotherhood affiliate in Tunisia. Right? They got a plurality of the vote. Of course, in Egypt, a, a parliamentary majority for the MV and the Salafi, 70% uh, of the seats, and Mohamed Morsi winning the first free presidential election in Egyptian history. The Muslim brother was, Brotherhood was supported by Qatar directly and indirectly by Turkey. The Turks saw the MV as uh, their natural allies. Erdogan took a kind of a famous victory tour a victory lap of, of uh, Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia in the fall of 2011, at the, at the height of the success of the brothers in the post-Arab Spring electoral contests. Of course, democratic Islamism is a real challenge to Saudi Arabia. Right? The Saudis have always been able to say, or at least they've tried to say, that they speak for Islam. Right? Back when they were fighting against Gamal Abdel Nasser, it was easy to say that because nobody thought Gamal Abdel Nasser was speaking for Islam. And he never made that claim. Right? He was an Arab nationalist. Then after the Iranian Revolution happens, you've got another big regime in the region that says it speaks for Islam. But the, but the Saudis say, well, they speak for Shia Islam. We speak for the real Islam, the Sunnis. Right? But with Muslim Brotherhood victories, especially in Egypt, largest Arab state, centrally important, culturally, politically, all those things. The Saudis saw a challenge to their claim to be able to speak for Islam and define what Islam means for politics in the Sunni Muslim world. It's not just the Muslim Brotherhood victories, I think, that shook the Saudis up. The fact that in Egypt, the Salafis, you know, the guys with the long beards and the short thobes, people who are, 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 are very similar culturally to right, the Wahhabi, Salafi, official version of Islam in Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> These guys ran for elections. Right? This was kind of a new thing. 
Salafis weren't supposed to run for elections. Salafis weren't supposed to see democracy as a legitimate form of government, right? In classic Salafi analysis, democracy is bid'ah, it's an innovation. And there's nothing worse for Salafis than innovations because they want to base their lives on what the Salaf, the pious ancestors of the past did, right? Why do we need to have elections when we have the law? In fact, you know, if you take that argument out to its extreme, elections are uh, apostasy because it sets up human beings as lawgivers and thus equates human beings with God. This is the side Qutb argument. This is the argument that Al-Qaeda makes. And this is the argument that the Saudi regime has always made. So not just Muslim Brotherhood victories, but the fact that Salafis are running in elections is something that can't please Riyadh. So what have their responses been, the Saudis and the Emirates? When they got involved, when the Saudis got involved in Syria, paradoxically, they supported the least sectarian, most secular fighting groups of the Free Syrian Army at the beginning. And then they kind of decided that the FSA wasn't doing the job, and they started supporting non-Al-Qaeda non Salafis, right? But their first impulse was to support the FSA, while Qatar and the Turks were supporting the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist groups in the Civil War. Of course, the Saudis are the most enthusiastic supporters of the coup in Egypt, right? Having promised billions of dollars and, de and actually delivered some of those billions to the Egyptian government of General Sisi. And finally, and most recently, the very public pressure that Saudi, the UAE, and Kuwait are putting on Qatar to try to get the Qataris to close down their support for the MBA. This has happened just over the past week. This axis of conflict, I think, will be as significant as the Sunni versus Shia part of the Arab, the new Middle East Cold War in determining the future of politics in the region. If this is a sectarian fight, the Sunnis don't have their act together. They are as conflictual among themselves as they are with their purported sectarian enemies, the Shia. All right, so uh, this is the Strauss Center. So we got to have a policy. I've uh, got to have a policy conclusion to this of what is to be done. Right? Uh, uh, the long-term solution, the long-term solution to the new Middle East Cold War is building functioning states. Right? It's building functioning states in the Middle East that will not be power vacuums into which regional actors Right, can play out their regional power games. The United States is very bad at that. Right? We are much better at state destroying than we are at state building. So I actually don't think that the United States has much to offer in terms of this of a long term, the long term fundamental issue that underlies this new Middle East poll. So the most common complaint that I hear when I go to the Middle East about Obama administration foreign policy <coughs> after weakness right, is inconsistency. Right? Your foreign policy is inconsistent. Well, if your prism is the new Middle East Cold War, yeah, we are inconsistent. We back an Iranian-supported government in Iraq that's fighting against a Sunni Muslim insurgency in which al-Qaeda groups play a major role. In Syria, we are kind of backing a Sunni Muslim insurgency that has important al-Qaeda elements to it against an Iranian-backed government. We say we're for democracy in Egypt, but we won't call the military coup a coup. We want to limit Iranian influence in the Middle East, 
and yet we negotiate, we're negotiating a nuclear deal with the Iranians. Uh, we can expand this list of inconsistencies. But I think that, that, that my take on this is that these are only inconsistencies if we accept a Saudi or an Egyptian view of what's driving regional politics. Right? If we say, if we in the United States say, we don't have a dog in this fight, we don't have a real stake in who wins this New Middle East Cold War, then maybe our policies aren't so inconsistent. The fact of the matter is, both Saudi Arabia and Iran care a lot more than Washington does about who governs Syria. I think that's just a fact. And because we don't care that much about who governs Syria, or we certainly don't care as much as the regional players about who governs Syria, our policy is, is in essence defined by other goals, right? We want a nuclear deal with Iran. I think this administration has put a lot of eggs in its, mid of its, Middle, Eastern in the, its Middle Eastern basket in getting some kind of deal with Iran that will limit Iran's breakout capacity right, to obtain a nuclear weapon. I think this administration sees that as playing a long game. Right? If it can get such a deal with the Iranians, then in the long run, those elements of the Iranian government who negotiated this deal will get stronger and perhaps be able to exert more influence over other elements of Iranian foreign policy, like General Qasem Soleimani, who I, whose picture I put up. That's a bet. That's a bet. Might not work. Right? The United States is also opposed to Salafi jihadism, and Al-Qaeda specifically. And thus, if the Syrian civil war is increasingly, if elements of the rebellion in Syria are increasingly identified as Salafi jihadist groups, <coughs> well, maybe it's not so important to us to get rid of Assad if those guys are going to get benefits. Right? And in the end, I just don't think Syria is, is as important to this administration as it is to our allies, principally Saudi Arabia and the region. So it might be an inconsistent foreign policy from regional point of view, but if you don't buy in to this framework of the new Middle East Cold War as defining your interests, right, American policy in the region just kind of hands off, right, uh, I think has its own internal logic. Thank you. Over for questions. Let's go back to the map, which is always more interesting than me. Fire away, Jason. All right, all right. Thanks so much for this talk. This is great. And this is going to be a Brookings paper. It's going to be a Brookings paper. Okay, yeah. so I just have an observation that might, just to clarify something that might be a tension in your right. argument and, and really underscore this, this interest Sunni uh, conflict point you're making. In Egypt, the South, it's true that the Salafis and the Muslim Brotherhood, after parliamentary mm -hmm. elections, constituted a majority, right. but within months, if not sooner, the Salafi Nur Party was very much in uh, Opposition. bristling at the Muslim Brotherhood government, which was not really sharing the pie with right. them. And I, I think most, I mean, most people who are analyzing this in Egypt see the Salafis there, the Nord Party in particular, very much in line with Saudi Arabia. They have notably been exempt from the current wave of repression that's going against the Muslim Brotherhood. And when I spoke with members of, of the Nord Party, they were very anti-Iranian. In contrast with uh, like El Gamal Islamiyah, here's a great kind of interesting tension, which is pro-Iranian and says, "Bring on the Iranian tourists!" And you know, we weren't turned into Shiism when during the Fatimid period, right. and we're not going to be turned into Shiites now. But Iran would be a great ally for us. And also, and goes so far as to say that the group that we should be worrying about in Egypt is not the Shia, tiny minority, but the Sufis. So, yeah. and Noor is against the Shia, and Al Gamal Islamiyah is against the Sufis. Yeah. So I just, when you say the fact that Salafis are running in elections is something that cannot please Riyadh, I just, I would, I would question that. It looks yeah. like they will continue to run in elections, and they may be sort of like play the role in the next 
parliament that most of others used to play. Right. So I, I, I take your point completely, right? I mean, the head of the NOR party stood behind General Sisi, <coughs> right? Sat behind General Sisi when Sisi announced the coup, right? He was one of the, of the array of Egyptian notables, including the Coptic Pope and the head of Al-Azhar, who, who you know, Sisi made stand behind him to show their support for the coup. Uh, I think that, that it's an interesting dynamic with Noor and the Saudis, right? Everybody in Egypt thought that the Saudi government funded the Noor campaign. Everybody in Saudi Arabia said, we had nothing to do with this, right? Uh, I, I think that Noor certainly was able to uh, tap private funding sources in Saudi. I, I have no question about that. But I, I had never seen any evidence that the Saudi government actually backed Noor. Now, the fact that the Saudis might appreciate the role of Noor in uh, the Noor party in <coughs> the current Egyptian government, the current Egyptian political scene, I think is uh, you know, a classic short-term, long-term, right? Uh, it seems to me that if, if you get in the biggest Arab country kind of a regularized Salafi participation in democratic politics, this, inv this inevitably is going to wave back into Saudi Arabia. It already has to some extent, right? Salman al-Alda, who is one of the kind of uh, Salafi, quote-unquote, opposition, he's a frenemy of the government in, in, in Saudi Arabia. He was in jail in the 90s. He was let out after 9-11 and became a very loyal a supporter of the government. Uh, he was actually let out before 9-11. But after 9-11, he became a very loyal supporter of the government. Right? During the Arab Spring, he was very pro the revolt in Egypt against Saudi government policy. He signed petitions calling for an elected majlis in Saudi Arabia. Right? He, he hasn't been put in jail, but he lost his TV show. But he's got the second most Twitter followers in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so I'm not allowed to this. Uh, so I, I think that you know, you, if, if the Saudi government thinks it can play tactically <coughs> in Egyptian politics, I, I think it's missing the longer term strategic challenge that you know, regularized Salafi participation in democratic politics could pose back home. Yeah. Uh, so, great talk. I just Thank wanted you. to push you a little bit on, like, policy recommendations. Sure. Because you do have this, you, you say that, well, it makes sense to think of the U.S. policy now as inconsistent, basically, mm -hmm. because the U.S. doesn't have, like, dogs in the kind of fights that the Saudis, in particular, <coughs> are, are worried about. Right. Uh, what do you think are the going to be the implications of that kind of, is, is this a pragmatic policy response, do you think, essentially, or do you think that there's a worst case scenario that can come of having this kind of inconsistent policy versus right. vis-a-vis your allies? So, so people, the, the worst case scenarios that usually get painted out of, uh, on the policy side on this are, A, the Saudis will uh, find other uh, uh, great power support and thus the United States will lose leverage in the Gulf on oil questions, etc. I find that highly unlikely. I, 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 think that if this, I think the Saudis would love to find alternative great power patrons, but I don't think they're out there. Uh, I don't think Russia, I think Russia, I see Russia as declining power despite, you know, its great victory in Crimea and perhaps its, uh, you know, great victory in Donetsk sometime soon. Uh, I, I just, you know, I just don't see Russia as a great power, and I don't think the Saudis do either. They also have some conflicting interests with Russia vis-a-vis -vis energy issues. And China, who they love, they love China, okay? Everybody in the Arab world loves China these days, right? In the same way that everyone in the Arab world loved us when it was the British and the French running the show, right? Back in the, back in the 20s and 30s, everybody loved us, right? Uh, the Chinese uh, don't have a navy that can project power into the Gulf. Maybe they will someday, but they don't. They don't have one now. So I, I I discount that worst case scenario. Second worst case scenario: the Saudis will get their own nuclear weapons, right? Because America, they can't count on America. America's gone soft on Iran. Possible, possible, right? They're not going to develop it indigenously. They have no nuclear infrastructure to speak of. Uh, at home, uh, but of course they have this long-standing relationship with Pakistan, and they did help fund the Pakistani nuclear program. But will the Pakistanis just give them warheads? Will they give? I don't know. I don't know. I think that that's a, that's not an automatic thing. Third worst-case scenario, right? 
uh, U.S. goes soft on Iran, Israel bombs Iran, the U.S. gets dragged into a conflict with Iran anyway. Possible? Possible, but so far the United States has been able to push the Israelis off on this. Right? This is a, I'm no military expert, Eugene might be able to answer these questions better than I, but uh, you know, this is no easy thing, bombing the Iranian, for the Israelis to bomb the Iranian nuclear facilities in any way that's effective at all, right? It's no easy thing. And the Israelis know this. And, and we certainly know that in Israel, there's a big debate on this issue, and a lot of military and security experts on the Israeli side have said, this is just a foolish, this is a foolish notion. It's a foolish notion. So that's a possibility, but I don't see it as a, as something that the U.S. has to change its policy in order to avoid. <coughs> Fourth, and perhaps most likely, worst case scenario, the spillover of the Syrian fighting in terms of refugees, uh, strengthening of Salafi jihadist movements, right, has a, a, an effect in Jordan and uh, accelerates the fighting in Iraq. To some extent, it already has done that in Iraq, there's also plenty of refugees in Syria. I mean, plenty of refugees in Turkey. I think the Turkish state can basically <coughs> handle that because it's so, so big, much bigger. And there's lots of Syrian refugees in Lebanon. The Lebanese state can't handle anything, right? But, you know, people say, well, this will destabilize Lebanon. And I go, more than it already is? So I'm not really sure, you know, the, the spillover in Lebanon could destabilize Lebanon even further, but that's not, that's not a huge change. So basically, we're talking about Jordan and Iraq. I think that what we do is what we're doing right now, right? You try to help the Jordanians to the greatest extent possible to deal with this <coughs> refugee overflow, right? The, the big refugee camp on the border it, with Jordan, uh, the Jordan-Syrian border, is now the fourth largest city in Jordan, right? Jordan's a pretty small place. But that's a huge number of people for a relatively small poor state. <laughs> so you just, you help them. The Emirates are doing it. The Emirates uh, are giving money. The Saudis, not enough. And we're in there trying to help. I think that's what you do. That, to me, the, the, the worst case, the most likely worst case scenario is some kind of, of spillover into Jordan that, you know, creates yet another weak or failing state. Yeah. Um, do you think there's any sort of threat of Saudi instability in the near future? No. No. Uh, I, I think with oil at hundred dollars a barrel, the Saudis are in good shape. Even with like say, you know, I know it's not. We're not sure what's going to happen, but even like with the shale boom and, and oil prices come down uh, because there's more. Saudi I'd say that's a that's a long-term secular problem. But even during all this talk about. You know, the energy revolution here in the United States, world energy prices have only come down a tiny bit, right? So there's so many other elements of this equation, like demand in East and South Asia, right? Uh, right? I figure that we're one big fracking accident away in the United States from real limitations on fracking, right? Now, I'm an East Coaster, so I'm 100% against fracking in New York and Pennsylvania. But I'm 100% in favor of it in North Dakota, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but, but my guess is that uh, if we have the equivalent of a Three Mile Island fracking incident in the United States, uh, a lot of these kind of straight line projections of how much energy we're going to produce out of these new technologies are going to change. So, I think you're absolutely right. If, if, if you're on a 20-year time horizon, and you, you believe that the technologies for, for you know, energy production are safe and sound and, and, and sustainable, then yes, we're going to see this in, in, in terms of global energy prices. Again, you know, maybe the Chinese demand goes up even further, but we're going to see this, right? But I think that's a 10 to 20 year time horizon. The Saudis have $800 billion in the bank. Right, from the run-up of oil prices since about 2004. 750, 800 billion dollars in liquid assets. 12 billion to the Egyptians, eh, it's just, you know, it's the stuff you find in the couch, right? Uh, so even if oil prices were to go down 
say, to $80 a barrel. And, the, and most estimates of the break-even price to fund the Saudi budget are about $85 a barrel right there. Say they go below 80, below, below 85 to like 80, which would be a 20% decrease in oil prices. Saudis have enough money to ride that out for a long, long time. So I actually think they're pretty stable. What, what are the elements of potential instability in Saudi Arabia? <clears throat> Generational change at the top, right? We're running out of the sons of Abdul Aziz, who the founder of the modern Saudi state. We're running out of his sons. At some point, someone of his grandson's generation is going to have to be named king. That's going to be an extreme, that's going to be an unprecedented shift, okay? It's going to privilege one or two lines within the family. It's going to cut out a number of others. That could be a very dicey political transition. The Saudi ruling family is an incredibly opaque institution, right? My line on them is, is those who talk about what goes on in the family don't know, and those who know about what goes on in the family don't talk. So I'm going to prove I don't know by talking a little about it, right? Uh, we just don't know what's going to happen. Maybe they've got it all worked out and it's all going to go smoothly. But if there is a juncture at which there could be a split in the elite, in Saudi Arabia that could lead to instability further down the system, it will be, I think, at that succession. <coughs> Eugene? Um, I always learn a lot from you, Greg, which is great. Um, so I want to learn two more things. Okay. Right? So the, the, the I hope are, are quick. Um, the first is uh, you explain a fair amount of Iran's kind of soft power influence, to use your yeah. adopted phrase, based on them being the overt anti-Israel people. Uh, my instinct is this can't possibly be true, so I want you to explain it to me more. So if you live in a country where there's major killing on your block, people are using chemical weapons and uh, uh, murdering people with power drills, how can you possibly care about some abstract opposition to Israel? So how is this a source of power? Right. The second thing is, um, uh, I don't understand the Qataris. Like, what, what are they thinking? Like, I understand what they are doing, but how do you think this is a good idea? Okay, all right. You're absolutely right on the Israel thing. I think that that was more of a pre-Arab Spring, pre-Syrian Civil War thing. It, it was always, I think, part of their overall policy not to be pigeonholed as a purely Shia power, right? Uh, that has been since the revolution, right? Ayatollah Khomeini said, this is not a Shia revolution, this is, a, this is an Islamic revolution, right? And the, the, the hard ideological position that Khomeini basically imposed on the Islamic revolution vis-a-vis -vis Israel, because most Iranians don't care about Israel, right? Uh, but, it was, but Khomeini did. And that was imposed, basically, became part of the, of, of the ideology. I think was used as a tool to kind of break out of a Shia ghetto, so to speak. But it was also the, you know, one of the two major pillars of the Syria alliance, right, was the common enmity toward Israel and common enmity toward Saddam Hussein when he was in the right? So Saddam's gone, but, right, that common enmity toward Israel uh, remains, uh, and, and the, the Syria conduit to Hezbollah is extremely important for uh, the Iranians in terms of supplying Hezbollah with arms and you know, that kind of thing. But you're right, in terms of the ability of the Iranians to attract, or to be an attractive patron on the, idea, on the ideological side, I don't think it, it cuts as much ice as it used to. Uh, Hamas has kind of taken some distance from Iran because of the Syrian civil war. Uh, when, the, when Fatah really wants to hit Hamas, they call him Shia, right? Uh, you know, this kind of bottom-up sectarianism thing. Uh, so I, I take your point completely on that. I, I, don't, I think that, that that particular element of the Iranian kind of uh, 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 catalog of, of power tools that they use in the region is in the the Qataris, I, I, I don't try to explain them, okay? Uh, I think that uh, it, they, it can't be explained on a state interest basis, right? Uh, 
I basically see Qatari foreign policy under the former Emir, Sheikh Hamad, who you know, uh, advocated in favor of his son last, last summer, as uh, the vanity project of a couple of guys. Right? Uh, this is the richest country in the world in terms of per capita income, uh, maybe Brunei. Uh, it, it took Sheikh Hamad about 15 minutes a day to run the country. Right? And, his, and his foreign minister and prime minister, uh, Sheikh Hamad bin Jassim, his cousin, uh, those are the two guys. It, it took him about 15 minutes a day to run the country. Well, that's a lot of hours left to do stuff. And these guys were ambitious. Right? They, wanted, they wanted to play a role on a larger stage. And, and they were very shrewd about it. Al Jazeera, right? the American military base, which gives them a security uh, 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 backstop against anybody, most notably the Saudis, doing anything to them. Uh, these crazy things about like wanting to have the World Cup. I just, I mean, I, I just don't think the World Cup is going to happen in Qatar. I just don't think it's going to happen, right? Uh, but, but going out and getting the World Cup, 2022, right? Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, this can't be explained on a kind of state interest basis, right? On a state interest basis, you keep your head down, you count your money, and you try not to make enemies. But they've gone out of their way to make enemies uh, and to insert themselves in places where there's no rational uh, 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 geopolitical ra uh, reason for this. But one of the things that they did Right? In this effort to, to swing a heavier bat, to punch above their weight, use whatever sports metaphor you want, you want uh, was they decided that the Islamists were the future. Right? And they started patronizing them. And for a while, this looked like a great strategy. Now, not so much. Right? The Saudis are really squeezing them right now. Right? The Saudis, the Emiratis, and the Kuwaitis have withdrawn their ambassador. Or no, the Saudis, the Emiratis, and the Bahrainis have withdrawn their ambassador from Qatar and have uh, kind of put out a list of demands uh, if, if the news reporting is to be believed on this. One, one demand of which is the closing of the Brookings Doha Center. So I might lose my non-resident senior fellow status relatively quickly. Might be lost by the end of this talk for all I know. E either because they've closed down or because someone in Qatar has actually seen what is going to be broadcast on the, on the Strauss Center website with me saying <laughs> that foreign policy is a vanity project for two guys. Uh, uh, so, uh, so what happens now? The, 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 the father has given over to the son, a young man, 33 years old, right? The Saudis obviously think they can, they can, they can squeeze this guy because he's a kid, right? Uh, but dad is still there. Right? And I don't think Sheikh Tamim, the, the emir, is going to just say to the Saudis, oh yeah, I give up. You know, when, when this is his father's foreign policy, that, that the Saudis are basically telling him he has to deconstruct. So how this is going to end, I don't know. But uh, my guess is that it's not going to end with Qatar ceasing to play a role in the region. Now, Qatar had already drawn back a bit. They're not nearly as prominent in Syria as they were two years ago. Right? Not nearly as prominent in Syria. Uh, and of course, the, the loss of the MB government <coughs> in Egypt has led to a real backlash against them in Egypt. In fact, the new Egyptian government gave the Qataris their money back, which I thought was the stupidest thing in the world. You know, Insult them, but by all means, keep their money. You know? uh, uh, so we've already seen some drawback, but, but the, the kinds of things that at least the press reports are saying the Saudis are demanding of the Qataris, I think, might be too far. Yes, sir? Um, if you were giving advice to the government of Israel at yeah. this point, what would you tell them to do? And secondly, uh, if Iran, in fact, does get the breakout capability and has the bomb, what then you think will happen. Yeah. I, have, I have a real minority viewpoint on this, okay? And I, I, don't, I don't want what I'm about to say to be taken as something that is generally believed. But I, I think an Iran with a nuclear weapon is uh, no different than Iran without a nuclear weapon. I basically think it's insignificant. 
in terms of the new Middle East Cold War. Mm -hmm. Because Iranian power is not based on its military power, it's based on its ability to patronize its clients. Right? Uh, I, I think, uh, look, I think the Iranians are rational actors, and thus I think deterrence would work between Israel and Iran in the same way that it would work, it worked between the US and the Soviet Union. I mean, the different assessment here is that Prime Minister Netanyahu does not think that the Iranians are rational actors. He thinks they're millenarians uh, willing to blow up, you know, large chunks of the Middle East and, and threaten to have their own large chunks of their own country blown up in order to bring about the destruction of Israel. I just disagree with his reading of it, right? I disagree with his reading of it. So I actually don't think an Iranian nuclear breakout is all that significant. Again, this is a minority viewpoint. Almost everyone disagrees with me. But, but that's, that's what I am. Um, this has been really interesting. Thank you. And I, one of the things that sort of strikes me is the story is very much about um, sort of capital financial resources and transnational links. Yeah. Um, and so given, for instance, so um, we talked about most of the countries in the region, um, largely which um, I know very, very little about. Yeah. Um, but you haven't mentioned much about Oman. Right. And they're particularly well situated with respect to capital financial resources. So I'm wondering if you could think, if you could tell us a little bit about um, sort of their role or lack thereof sure. in your discussion. Then I have one other question, um, which was about sort of your policy implications discussion. So you suggested that the U.S. is not particularly good at state building right. here, and so maybe we should bow out gracefully, or maybe not so gracefully. Or maybe not so gracefully, <laughs> just bow out. Yeah. Um, but so given um, sort of the importance of the transnational um, links and sort of what constitutes an acceptable alliance, which you were sort of talking about a bit earlier, I wonder if you could sort of use that to tell us a little bit about who would constitute acceptable state building forces in the area. Right. Uh, on Oman, first off, it's it's uh, it's one of the oil monarchies, but it's one of the oil poorer monarchies, right? Uh, um, Omani production is, I think it's about seven hundred thousand barrels a day, so it's not it's not that much, right? The Kuwaitis produce over two million barrels a day with a much smaller population. The Emiratis produce over two million barrels a day. The Saudis can produce anywhere from eight and a half to ten million barrels a day. To so you're talking about a place that doesn't have a lot of surplus capital, right? It, it basically, uh, it spends the money domestically. So it can't play the kind of game that Qatar and the Emirates and Saudi do, right? Uh, because it doesn't have that big stock of money that it's willing to throw around. It's also been, in, in many ways, the most capital R realist of all the, of all the Gulf states, right? Back when Sadat made peace with Israel, Hello. Back when Sadat made peace with Israel in 79, every Arab state in here broke relations with Sadat except Oman. Right. At the height of the Iranian Revolution, when Ayatollah Khomeini was saying that monarchy is un Islamic and the Iranian uh, state was trying to export the Islamic Revolution across the Gulf, Oman maintained very business like relations with the Iranians. They jointly manage the Strait of Hormuz because it's hard to see on this map, but there's a little bit of Oman right there, the Musandam Peninsula, uh, that's cut off from the rest of Oman by the Emirates, but that's Omani territory. So the Omanis and the Iranians have always had a very businesslike relationship in managing Hormuz. Uh, and of course, Oman uh, was the go-between for the current round of talks between Iran and the U.S. So the Sultan, uh, Sultan Qaboos, has always been kind of, in my mind, the, the, the ultimate realist. He deals with the powers that be as they are. And uh, so he's not going off on, on, on missions to increase Oman's profile in the world or to try to affect the domestic politics of other places. He doesn't have the money and he doesn't have the ambition. He's pretty much Omani centered. Interestingly enough, he has not joined this pressure on Qatar. He hasn't withdrawn his ambassador. He hasn't kind of said, oh, the, we have to bring the Qataris to heel. Uh, so he'll be one of the guys who mediates the eventual kissy face makeup uh, that'll eventually happen. 
Uh, what was the other one? I'm sorry. Can we move on to an acceptable, stable, and forced? Force right. I mean, really uh, look, the more we get over to North Africa, right, the more the EU is the player, right? Uh, economically, the North African states are much more tied to Europe than they are to anybody else. That's where the, the migration patterns are. Uh, the EU has a real interest in the maintenance of political stability in North Africa because they want to reduce the migrant population, at least that's what they say. Uh, the EU doesn't have the same kind of political uh, uh, baggage that we have on Arab-Israeli questions, but the further out you get into North Africa, in that, the less it matters. I think the EU is the, is the framework here just because they have a lot more interest in North Africa than we do, right? If you're talking about Syria and Iraq, I don't have a good answer. Uh, I, I don't have a good answer. Uh, I wish I did. Yeah? Um, so my understanding is that Sultan Qaboos is a fairly old guy. He's a spring chicken compared to the Saudi king. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's in his late 60s or early 70s, yeah. He has no sons. Uh, he has no sons, uh, and he's not likely to have any sons anytime soon. Uh, he's, uh, th there's a Baroque succession process in Oman that the Sultan has set up where uh, his family, the larger family, the El Said family, will meet after his death. And if in, within three days they don't propose a candidate, to the Omani state entities, the state council, basically. Uh, a, a secret letter written by the Sultan will be opened that will name his successor. Yes, this sounds like a 19th century novel, I know, but that is, that is the succession process as it now stands in Oman. Okay? So, uh, as we say in the Arab world, Allahu Alam, God knows what will come. Of, of this process, okay? Uh, and that's about all I can say about it. I see a question over here? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, in reference to the, uh, the proxy areas that you were talking about, where these <coughs> different uh, interests are playing out, Yeah. Uh, I've heard a term used uh, once or twice, uh, neo-automism. Yes. Now, is, is that something that uh, the Turkish administration sees in terms of itself, or is that largely something that is, is imposed upon them? Yeah. Imposed upon them. What, what do you, what do you right. Uh, there have been plenty of analysts who have said the, the Erdogan Davutoglu foreign policy of no problems with neighbors was neo Ottomanism, i.e., the Turks wanted to regain influence in the territories of the former Ottoman Empire. They don't really talk about, you know, the real heartland of the Ottoman Empire, which was southeastern Europe, right? What they're talking about is the Arab world, basically. <clears throat> I think that it's true that Turkey wanted to reintegrate and, and, and reestablish influence in the Arab world. Uh, I think that that was driven primarily by uh, economic interests, right? Booming economy export markets, right? Uh, I think that there was a, a, a bit of a political tag on that, right? But I don't see it as neo-Ottomanism in that I don't think that, I don't think Erdogan and David Doglu ever thought that they were going to run the show, right? I think they just wanted to, you know, play in the game. What Syria has done, right? What Syria has done in to, the, to, to this is to really up the cost of playing the game. And in general, the Turks have not liked the cost. So uh, my understanding, although I don't follow Turkey on a day-to-day -day basis, my understanding is that uh, Erdogan's policy in Syria is now very unpopular in Turkey. It's seen as extremely costly in terms of uh, refugee burden, 
it's seen as having failed in that Erdogan was way out front in calling for Assad to step down. Right? And it, it's seen as having brought uh, the Salafi jihadists right to the Turkish border. Uh, I don't think that this is uh, one of the major drivers of the problems domestically Erdogan has had in the last 12 months, right? The, the riots in Taksim, the split with the Gulen movement, you know, the kinds of things that have made Erdogan's <coughs> political position much less strong than it was, but much weaker than it was before. But there's certainly no stomach in the Turkish military or in Turkish public opinion for a more active role in Syria. And if you're going to be neo-Ottoman, you have to be the biggest voice in Damascus. And I don't think that's a price that the Turkish government's going to want to pay. Let me ask the last sure. question, since we're five minutes <coughs> overdue here. Uh, last year, one of your colleagues uh, from the University of Durham, Christopher Davidson, yes. published a book that I'm sure you know what I'm referring to. Oh, yes, it's indeed. called After the Sheets, After the, the Collapse yep, yep, of yep. the Gulf Monarchy. And as someone who is a little more interested in the monarchy than the Middle East <laughs> would say, I'm wondering what you see happening, is, and I'm sure you read the book or you yeah, did his thesis, and, I did. Yeah. And, and what do you think about it? So I, I, I think Chris is wrong uh, about this. He actually had made a point, a, a, a point prediction, which is, you know, death to political science. Yeah. Uh, he said that these regimes, the, the monarchical regimes <laughs> along the Arab side of the Persian Gulf would collapse within five years. Uh, he made that prediction in 2012, maybe even the end of 2011. We'll say 2011, all right? So we'll know by the end of 2016 whether this uh, prediction has come true. It certainly hasn't come true by the uh, middle of 20, or the beginnings of 2014, right? Uh, I, I think analytically, the flaw in the book is that he, he, he identified a number of serious problems that these countries have, right? And then said, uh, because they have these serious problems and because the region is changing, these regimes will not be able to sustain themselves QED. I think the problem is that he identified a lot of problems that have these, these countries, that have characterized these countries for decades, right? Uh, youth bulges, uh, inability to diversify their economies away from oil, uh, you know, lack of uh, effective and real uh, avenues for political participation in almost all of them, uh, Kuwait being the exception. Uh, yes, all these things are true, but they have been true for a long time. And since he didn't uh, predicate his argument on a fall in oil prices. I, I think that he misunderstands the dynamics that, that sustain these regimes, which I think are, are mostly about patronage states based on oil. But do you think that you could make an argument that, in fact, the Arab Spring cemented the stability of these? Uh, I, in fact, did make that argument in a paper that I, uh, that I wrote for Brookings, a, a co-authored piece that I did in Journal of Democracy. Uh, unlike you and some of your stuff, I, I actually don't see the monarchical form of government as a, uh, an element of that stability. Uh, because, you know, I've seen so many monarchies fall in the Middle East in the modern period that I don't, I don't think that there's something about monarchy that, that uh, makes you more stable. Uh, other people do. Mike Herb has made that argument uh, very strongly. Uh, uh, and you, Zoltan, have made it in, in that piece you did for parameters. Uh, and so this is, I think, an argument worth having, right? Is it, does monarchy qua regime type actually make you strong? Uh, but I think, I, 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 I'm very, I'm very confident that at $100 a barrel, these countries can maintain their patronage networks in such a way that uh, they'll uh, prove Chris Davidson wrong. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you.